Hi, folks. Welcome to the August 2023 edition of the ARIMA webinar series. Uh, today's topic is a particularly relevant and interesting one beyond GWAS uncovering the functional context of variants with multiomics. I would like to introduce our very first speaker, Anthony Schmidt, the SVP of Science here at ARIMA. Anthony has been at ARIMA for a very long time, and Anthony, we're very excited to have you as our ARIMA speaker today, and the floor is yours. All right, thanks, Janetta. Great. Well, yeah, thanks to those uh, who keep coming back to our webinar series, and welcome uh, to those of you where this is your first webinar series. Uh, the goal, I really have two goals today. Um, I'd like to introduce ARIMA for those who are not familiar with ARIMA, um, but I also want to introduce what we mean by 3D genomics and really spend the rest of the time talking about the underlying technologies in the 3D genomics uh, uh, field and just touch on some of the applications of those technologies, specifically with respect to gene regulation. So hopefully this 15-minute session will be introductory uh, for those who are not familiar with 3D genomics um, and its applications and some of the tools. Um, and it also will hopefully um, be a good technical foundation um, uh, to help uh, sort of understand uh, some of the work that you'll hear from Dr. Grant um, after me. All right, so to get things kicked off, I mean, really, when I explain 3D genomics uh, uh, to people who are not familiar with 3D genomics, I always kind of you know, sort of, sort of level set that, or or compare it to some to you know something that everyone is is more familiar with, which is what we call linear genomics, which is just the traditional sequencing and the traditional representation of the genome as a linear uh, sort of thread of A's, T's, C's, and G's, which you see over here on the left side of your screen. And compared to the conventional linear genomics thinking, three D genomics is really a combination of still obtaining that underlying sequence information of A's, T's, C's, and G's, but simultaneously measuring the three-dimensional structure of that DNA within cells. So we, so we refer to it as obtaining both the sequence and the structure of the genome or of, of uh, chromosomes. And you'll, of course, see sort of more of what I mean about that in the coming, in the coming slides. And why we think 3D genomics is so powerful is it really sits at the center of three different uh, sort of applications and, uh, you know, into, into genomics. So like I said on the last slide, 3D genomics still obtains that underlying genetic sequence information that you would get from traditional next generation, you know, sequencing approaches because 3D genomics, um, particularly the approaches that we leverage at ARIMA are sequencing-based measurements of the 3D structure of the genome. So you obtain that underlying sequence. Uh, second, up here at the top, is you obtain the structure of chromosomes. And even though I'm not going to talk about this particular application today, there's a whole sort of wealth of information on our website and other webinars, if you want to check those out, where you know we thought, well, <laughs> in diseases such as cancer, uh, structural variants are a major driver of, 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 of cancer. They're therapeutically targetable, they're diagnostic or they're prognostic. And we are wielding a tool that can identify and, and resolve the structure of uh, chromosomes. And so if you have variations, you know, pathogenic variations to the structure of chromosomes, then a tool such as 3D genomics which measures the structure of chromosomes it is just inherently well suited to identify variations to the structure of chromosomes that may drive cancer. And then what I'll be talking about mostly today is really the application of 3D genomics to identify these long range 3D interactions in the genome and how that sort of yields insights into how genes are regulated in three dimensional uh, space. If you peel that back just a little bit more, shown here are, are sort of five of the variety of use cases that our customers and you know, researchers in general are using 3D genomics for. At the top, which I'm not gonna talk about is 
3D genomics data, in particular, you know, genome-wide high C data, has become really a staple in the process of assembling genomes de novo. And kind of as we focus down to these next three um, applications is really what we're going to be focused on today from analyzing all different hierarchical layers of genome organization from compartments to TADs to uh, chromatin loops. And also this really interesting application that Dr. Grant's going to talk about, which I'm just going to mention sort of, you know, briefly in this introduction of using 3D genomics data to link non-coding disease-associated variants to potential uh, uh, to uh, target genes, which may be uh, disease that drive uh, uh, genes that uh, drive disease pathogenesis. You hear much more about that from Dr. Uh, Grant. And just you know, very very briefly, everything that uh, you hear from me today and all the technologies are both available in kit format as well as service format. Okay, really, you know, I mean, we truly believe at Arima that. 3D genomics uh, fits perfectly into sort of a multi-omics approach to understand biology and understand the you know, function of the genome. Kind of sitting here in this, in this milieu with genetic approaches or you know, genome sequencing approaches, epigenomic approaches, gene expression data. And what 3D genomics really provides is how the 3D organization of the genome regulates or helps helps to regulate gene expression through long range interactions. And a typical sort of experimental setup and, and you know what you see in you know uh, the hundreds of publications that we that we have is really a set of complementary data sets that really help you understand gene regulation. Starting with you know gene expression data and, and you know Analyzing that across a range of different of different conditions to detect differential gene expression, probably a very common, you know, molecular readout of a of a cellular phenotype being sort of RNA expression data, as well as epigenomics data like a TAC-seq or ChIP-seq data to identify differential chromatin states. So you have expression data, chromatin state data, and then the third piece is the three D genomics data with approaches such as high C, and it, Again, like I said in the beginning, that analyzed in concert with the gene expression data and other chromatin data really helps you resolve mechanisms of long-range long range gene regulation and obtain a more comprehensive understanding of genome function. Well, so what are some of the tools uh, that we have developed at ARIMA to sort of aid in that research? Well, we've been trying very hard at ARIMA to develop a technology platform <clears throat> to enable all different types of 3D genomic analysis. And the core technology that we have at Arima is called HI-C, which stands for High Throughput Chromatin Confirmation Capture. And within that umbrella, there's a variety of different approaches that are really designed uh, uh, to sort of best answer specific biological questions. So starting on the far left, we have genome-wide HI-C analysis, which is just like it sounds. It's genome-wide you know, sequencing, genome-wide uh, measurement of the 3D organization of the genome, which allows you to analyze the 3D genome, of course, genome-wide, but across all scales from chromosome territories, compartments, tags, all the way down to chromatin loops. And then really there's been a host of different targeted approaches for 3D genomics that are purpose-built, I go think, for specific biological questions. Uh, a couple of these here that I'm circling with my laser pointer now are called Capture HiC, which is based on target enrichment of HiC libraries to really just sequence those specific sequence elements and the 3D structure of those targeted sequence elements. So a common approach would be to design a set of capture probes and pull down promoters in the genome and understand how the how the promoters are folding in three dimensional space without having to sequence the entirety of the genome. And we'll talk more about that in a bit, as well as high chip, which enriches for chromatin proteins to understand the 3D architecture of those loci that are bound by particular chromatin proteins, uh, such as CTCF or other histone modifications. So really, I think to, to explain the technology, it, it's helpful to start with genome-wide high C. Um, here's just an example of the workflow. I have one one workflow slide if you're interested in 
in this. Uh, starting on the left, we have a variety of different sample types for which we have validated protocols from blood, frozen tissues, cell lines, as well as formalin-fixed paraffin embedded tissues, which is particularly useful uh, in uh, translational research on archived, um, on archived uh, specimens. And then really, the core Arima High C technology is a sample preparation technology where in to the assay goes these sample types here on your left, and out comes DNA, which is then put into library prep where you ligate your adapters and amplify, and then you sequence, and then you analyze the data using a variety of different tools, um, really de depending on the application of the data. And we try to enable that with um, bio bioinformatics pipelines, which you can uh, download from our GitHub page uh, for the for the different approaches that we've, that we've developed. And really how high c preserves the 3D genome, I think can be summed up by these three steps uh, shown here at the bottom. And so over here on the far left is really just a zoom in of two pieces of DNA within the genome that are held together in three-dimensional space. And so you cross-link that DNA within the cells, right? So you have a dark blue piece and a light blue piece that are held together in three-dimensional space because they're both bound by the same uh, protein. But they those two sequences could actually be derived from very far apart along the linear genome, but they've sort of looped together, if you will, and they're now close together in 3D space. And so we cut that DNA with restriction enzymes, as you can see here by these gray slash marks, and then we ligate those two spatially proximal pieces of DNA together Right. And in doing that, we've really captured or preserved information that the light blue and the dark blue piece of DNA were spatially proximal to each other, right? Because they had to be close enough to be ligated to each other. And then really the goal at that point is to sequence these molecules that are that are part dark blue and part light blue on the same paradigm read. And, and that effectively tells you that the dark blue piece and the light blue piece were spatially proximal to each other. And that's that's effectively one data point from one cell of spatially proximal DNA. And this is often done throughout the cell and throughout a population of, of cells, uh, although there are single cell approaches that are available as well. And these data are often represented as a heat map. Um, so just you know briefly, these data are often represented as a heat map such as this, where you have chromosomes here along the y-axis of this heat map and the same chromosomes uh, uh, on this axis of the heat map. And that red color is effectively how many high C reads or how, or how many 3D interactions are happening between any two pair of loci in the genome. And the first thing that stands out at this genome-wide view is that there's lots of intra-chromosomal interaction signal. So the majority of the reads involving chromosome one are interacting with other regions within chromosome one. And you can see that along the diagonal of the heat map here. And there's very few interactions kind of out in this interchromosomal uh, space. So this is really just capturing uh, an aspect of the 3D genome, which was already known, which is called you know, chromosome territories, which, which basically is that Within interphase nuclei, uh, uh, chromosomes tend to fold and sort of interact with themselves. Well, let's let's zoom in uh, to some of these higher resolution 3D genome features that you can see with IC data. So right now I'm basically blowing up and sort of zooming into a particular region on chromosome two, about 700 kilobase region here. And to sort of help understand what we're looking at here, I'm going to drop four reference points along the genome, right, by these different dots. And the first thing that stands out to me, which may also stand out to you, are these sort of off-diagonal punctate red dots that you can see here. You can also see one over, over here in these sort of triangular patterns. Right? So to help understand kind of how to go from a high C heat map and these data to understanding, well, how what might be happening sort of in these individual cells and how might the how might the 3D genome be folding? Well, right here you have uh, the purple dot and the green dot, and this is sort of represented as like the linear thread. But what these data are 
telling you by this high frequency interaction between the purple and the green, as well as the gray and the blue, is that that structure might look something like this, where you have these point to point looping interactions between the purple and the green and the gray and the blue and the chromatin groups sort of extruded out of the genome, right? To observe those type of high frequency interactions between those reference points that I dropped along the genome. And how this has sort of been applied, there's been, uh, I think we have a, over 300 publications which you can access on our website, but a really nice example, I think, of not only you know high C data, but the integration of that with other omics data sets like ChIP-seq data sets and RNA-seq data is this paper that was published in 2020 by this um, Iophantus and the Syragos labs at NYU, where they profiled by high C healthy T cells as well as T cell acute lymphoblastic leukemia cells. There's a really interesting story here uh, at the MIC locus. So what we're looking at here is about a three megabase region along chromosome eight. Uh, and here, right at the edge of this topological domain is the MIC gene. You can see this sort of tr tracing of this triangle, which means there's a really high frequency of interactions within this domain over here. And then there is sort of a boundary here, and then another self-interacting topological domain over here, which contains these known super enhancer elements. And in the healthy T cells, very little interaction between the super enhancer region and the MIC gene. And what was just so striking, I think, is when you look at the same region in the T cell acute lymphoblastic leukemia cells, you see sort of this really interesting like coalescence of those two neighboring uh, topological domains into one sort of larger uh, domain that you can see that I'm tracing here. And while this is really interesting, I think when you correlate that with the underlying, you know, uh, chromatin data, it's sort of even more, even more revealing. Where in the healthy T cells, uh, the CTCF binding profile, you see this really strong CTCF peak, kind of right here in the middle of the region, which would correspond perfectly to this boundary between these two topological domains. And in the leukemia cells that CTCF peak goes away, which may sort of help explain why you see the coalescence of these two neighboring domains into one larger domain. And the other thing that you can appreciate from the K27 acetylation data is really no activity at these super enhancer elements in the healthy T cells, but then a real increase in that K27 acetylation enhancer activity in the leukemia cells. It's really you know, and and sort of the last piece of this is when you look at the expression of the NIC gene, also higher in the leukemia cells and lower in the in the healthy T cells. And when you take when you put all these things together, you can really sort of appreciate how the 3D genome helps you understand how NIC is regulated both in the healthy state over here, as well as how it's misregulated in the disease uh, state over here. Lots more really, I think, nice information in this paper of how they use these data to to ultimately identify a potential way to um, reduce NIC expression through the in inhibition of uh, proteins that bind to these super enhancer elements. And what I'm going to leave off with is just a really brief discussion on uh, captured high C technology. Um, here is a quick workflow figure uh, that we have here. And really, without even looking at the workflow figure, capture high C is, is very similar to other you know, targeted sequencing approaches like exome sequencing or other gene panel approaches, or except here you design capture probes and you enrich your high C library uh, for any sequence element of interest and obtain the 3D interactions of those sequence elements that you've enriched. There's really, a, I think, a broad set of uses for this uh, capture high C technology. Um, some, some researchers use genome-wide approaches first to formulate hypotheses, and then they design capture panels to then test a higher number of samples with that sort of targeted approach. Um, you can increase the resolution by sequencing just a particular region of the genome very, very deeply uh, and for less cost and computational uh, complexity. And so just to sort of think about how this might apply to your, to your own research, um, there's the uh, promoter capture concept where you enrich for all promoters in the genome or just a subset of promoters. Um, you can also enrich for, uh, you know, GWAS regions in the genome to try to physically link those non-coding GWAS variants to, to their 
uh, distal target genes, which you'll hear more about from Dr. Grant, and region capture, which is really just tiling across a region in the genome and being able to sequence that really, really deeply and obtain very high, high uh, resolution 3D interactions in that region. And there's a swath of different publications uh, from our customers on our website where you can check these all out. So in sum, uh, we think that 3D genomics is really a powerful tool for, for those three key elements that I mentioned in the beginning, obtaining sequence information, identifying structural variants, and uh, gene regulatory mechanisms all with a single data type. And it really helps you address a variety of different questions related to gene regulation, including the interpretation of GWAS variants, which we'll hear about in just a moment. And there's a variety of different approaches, both genome-wide and targeted, that have each been designed to address specific uh, biological questions. Now that, yeah, thanks for your attention. Uh, and I'll turn it back over to Janetta. Thanks, Anthony, um, for that wonderful presentation. Um, now I would like to introduce our guest speaker, Dr. Struan Grant. Dr. Grant is the director of the Center for Spatial and Functional Genomics at the Children's Hospital of Philadelphia. He's also the professor of genetics and pediatrics at the University of Pennsylvania School of Medicine. Dr. Grant and his lab utilize high throughput genotyping, 3D genomic-based sequencing, statistical and bioinformatic methods to investigate the genomic complexities of various common diseases with a focus on pediatrics. Dr. Grant, thank you so much for being here with us today and the floor is yours. Thanks again. So yeah, I'm uh, Struan Grant and as mentioned, I'm at uh, Chalk and at Penn. And if you have any questions, don't hesitate to reach out. I've got the easiest email address in the world, grants at chalk.edu. I get a lot of emails about budget justifications and those sort of things. Nice to get some scientific questions. Um, so um, as you can tell from my title, um, I'm, um, you know, I am a GWASer. And um, obviously the field is looking beyond uh, GWAS now. And so by starting off by just talking about some of the uh, positive outcomes of GWAS in terms of my own personal experience, some of the shortcomings of GWAS, and then to really harness what we found um, in the context of certain disease examples, sleep, obesity, bone, diabetes, and lupus, and particularly how I'm harnessing that using epigenetic approaches, including chromatin ca uh, confirmation capture methods. So this is sort of how I see the progress of common complex trait genetics and genomics. So in the old days, when I was doing my PhD, uh, we really were focused on candidate genes and we would literally uh, work on a gene in the lab, maybe find a polymorphism and do it by RFLP. Um, it's a very, very sort of low throughput. Um, and then linkage really was the first opportunity where we could look genome wide to find genes associated or linked to diseases. And that was really the domain of statisticians. We then entered the field of GWAS and copy number variation using arrays. And we were very dependent on clinicians to provide us uh, large sample sizes to be able to detect associations. We then have moved into the region of whole genome sequencing and exome sequencing. And that's really the domain of bioinformaticians. But I would argue with this confluence of um, data and a lot billions of, of dollars worth of data in the public domain, we can start distilling down these, uh, these leads and really return to the lab. And again, the molecular biologists, I believe, are going to be the, again, the new stars, the next stars of common complex trait genetics. In terms of where I sort of planted my flag uh, in terms of interest with respect to the GWAS era, it was really type 2 diabetes, but it was more from a, a slightly niche area, which was looking at the pediatric route to type 2 diabetes. If you have childhood obesity, you're more likely to have diabetes in later life. If you've got an unusual birth weight, you're more likely to have type 2 diabetes in later life. We also see unusual cases of type 2 diabetes in children. That's unfortunately increasing in prevalence. And there are other types of diabetes I'm interested in, which I'll, I'll not cover here. More recently, I've got interested in orthogonal traits, which I'll also cover. Uh, the influence of sleep um, can influence the susceptibility to obesity and diabetes. And also, uh, these traits can lead on to having influences on bone. So really, as you can probably tell, I'm very interested in the sort of endocrine trait space. And so uh, just to give you a flavor of GWASs that I've been involved with, um, it's been largely through the early uh, the early growth genetics consortium, the egg consortium, where we've been meta-analyzing data sets 
from various different centers that have got pediatric data sets that have been genome-wide genotyped. And so this was the GWAS that we led for egg for childhood obesity. What I want to bring your attention to is the Empire State Building signal in this Manhattan plot, the FTO locus. And the FTO locus uh, comes up as the strongest hit in both children and in adults. And FTO has received a lot of attention from uh, various groups. And, um, and um, these three papers in the corner here, uh, starting with Marcello Nobrega and the University of Chicago, um, working on the uh, FTO locus and asking the question, you've got these bunch of genetic signals sitting in FTO, but does it actually affect the expression of FTO? And his, his group's conclusion was that in fact, it's influencing the gene next door, IRX3, rather than FTO. Added to that, the complexity grew in that uh, the other paper here, the New England Journal paper um, suggests from MIT, suggested it's IRX3 and IRX5. Now these studies were done in an, an adipose setting. But when looking in the brain, the Columbia group in their cell metabolism paper said, we think it's the gene on the left. So the pessimists would go, oh my goodness, this is really complex and there's multiple genes at play. The optimists would say, well, this is really interesting and I'm getting more targets for the price of one signal. But what's become clear and really what this was, was the starting gun to actually start to try and understand uh, the effective gene or genes at GWAS loci. And so really the question we've been asking ourselves as a community is we've got this variant, it's almost entirely non-coding in most GWAS signals. The question is, is it driving the nearest gene that it's, it's near, or is it further afield? Is it, is it an embedded enhancer in one gene, and it's actually a driving the expression of another gene, as was seen with uh, FTO? And the way I've been thinking about it, and again, leveraging data that's come out of the public domain IC efforts, is that um, really considering what genes are at play uh, in the neighborhood that we should consider. And so in the, in the topic, if, I'm, if we look at this red star, let's say that's the actual causal variant, and the red gene is the causal gene. If we'd just gone with the nearest gene, the one circled in blue at the top here, we'd have got the wrong gene. If we just use an arbitrary window, looking uh, left and right, we'd have missed the correct gene. But using topologically associating domains that Antonio referred to, um, then you would have caught it. And so I have, I'm not entirely dependent on TAD structure, but largely our observations obey TAD structure. So having TAD information on a given, on a given uh, uh, cell type is, is, is extremely useful. One locus I've been very interested in is the TCF7L2 locus. And here's uh, a Manhattan plot from a, a GWAS of type 2 diabetes from a few years ago. There's more loci since that have been reported. But what remains consistent is that the top signal um, is at the TCF7L2 locus. And one of the better days in my career was uh, I was fortunate enough to report the TCF7L2 association with type 2 diabetes first uh, back in 2006. So I remain in interested in this locus. Um, but when the FTO study came out or those studies came out, I was concerned that I was actually going on and studying the wrong gene. Am I actually looking at the correct gene at this location, or is it in fact TCF7L2? And in fact, if we look at the TAD that uh, harbors TCF7L2, there's quite a lot going on there. Now, TCF7L2 itself is not a particularly interesting target in that it's a transcription factor that's sort of ubiquitously expressed and highly alternatively spliced. But in there, there are possibly more attractive targets for therapeutic intervention. So by trying to elucidate what the causal gene or genes in this neighborhood are, um, could have utility. And so we asked the question using a combination of CRISPR perturbation and chromatin capture as a sort of initial study. I won't go into any detail, but this really spurred us on to do more of this. The community is largely agreeing that the main signal at TCF7L2 for type 2 diabetes is this SNP. And so by perturbing this SNP, we observed in a colon setting, there's some debate where this exerts its primary effect, but we looked in the colon setting um, 
and uh, we saw that it was perturbing the expression of TCF7L2 and also ACSL, ACSL5. ACSL5 is an enzyme and therefore maybe more attractive for therapeutic intervention. A knockout uh, mouse already existed for ACL5. It toughs and it does turn out that the mouse is diabetic. So we're interested in this. This is clearly uh, something that may be temporal. Um, it may be occurring in different uh, cell types differently. So I think this is still to be mapped out. But the point is that in our hands, in our cells, in our particular cell type of interest, we observed two genes. So we, based on that, we, we were compelled to sort of really start following up GWAS signals that, uh, that, that we had found at the Children's Hospital of Philadelphia, given that we've got this large collection of pediatric samples that have been genome-wide genotyped. And, and really for my first decade there, we've reported a large range of GWASs for various childhood onset diseases. So myself and my uh, fellow director, Andrew Wells, started the Center for Spatial and Functional Genomics. And this is basically the, the concept that we look at the Sentinel SNP, the top SNP at the Empire State Building signal in the Manhattan plot, and then all the SNPs that are in linkage to equilibrium or co-travelers, if you were well, coming through the generations. And then asking which of those proxy variants obey two criteria. Are they open through, through uh, uh, a taxi? And is uh, the uh, open SNP contacted by a gene promoter? This helps us reduce the complexity of the region and gives us candidate causal variants and candidate causal genes. That then leads to this last panel where we can go, and given whatever uh, cellular context we're interested in, uh, do functional studies either in my own lab or with collaborators. And when we first started this, uh, there was already chromatin capture studies out there. There was high C, but at that time, even though there's this great paper from Peter Fraser, um, we felt it was maybe slightly low resolution. It was uh, based on a six cutter, and I'll come to that in a, in a couple of slides. Uh, there's high chip, but very dependent on a particular epigenetic mark. What we liked about Capture C, which was published by uh, the, uh, an Oxford group, was that it was high resolution and, and highly scalable. And so that's where we planted our flag initially with chromatin capture. And so Alessandra Casey and my group, who's now moved on to a faculty position at Penn, um, designed a custom Sure Select library where we put probes uh, uh, into each, um, uh, each uh, gene in the genome or the promoter of each gene in the genome, plus all non-coding genes that have been reported up to that point. And then based on that, we had 36,000 uh, baited fragments, and uh, then we'd sequence deeply um, um, using a NovaSeq S2 flow cell. And in fact, we're doing it on S4 now for, for even deeper sequencing. Um, given that we this was our custom design, and, uh, and really we were doing a promoter ohm, looking at every promoter in the genome, um, we had to develop our own bioinformatics. And so that, that also went hand in hand with this custom design in Alexander was central to that. And really what we've learned from this is that resolution really does matter. Um, when we compare our four cutter capture C design, where we're really chopping the gene up, genome up finely, as opposed to the lower resolution first uh, stage high Cs that came out, um, that we have a higher detection range for nearby uh, interactions, whereas the more Infrequent cutting, uh, you have a sort of myopia around the nearest uh, genes. And so by doing this, we could have range with respect to nearby interactions, plus also further interactions. And in fact, we can also collapse down the fragments into bigger chunks, if you will, and be able to get greater range as well. So by having this resolution, um, uh, we could, we could uh, look both close and far. And so I'm just going to give you some examples how we've applied this and how this is sort of emer how we're emerging from this. Our first our first inroads into this approach was using lupus as an example, and uh, Andrew Wells, as I say, my fellow director, um, uh, said, "Well, we can get hold of T follicular helper cells because there's a lot of tonsillectomies happening at CHOP. So let's um, uh, let's uh, collect those 
and then do chromatin capture and attack seek and RNA seek. And then let's see if we can infer causal genes at GWAS loci for lupus. And um, having not, not been involved in lupus GWAS at all previously, this was sort of new to us, but we, we took those SNPs that had been published and we asked what was going on. And so then this example, this key example I'd like to show you, there was a lot of excitement in the field about the LPP locus for lupus. And indeed, uh, we found a proxy SNP, a SNP that fulfilled our criteria, that was an LD with the top SNP, was open and contacting a gene promoter um, within, embedded within LPP. But all our evidence pointed to a gene pretty much on the other side of the TAD in a gene called uh, BCL6. And to Andrew, this was really a household name, unlike LPP, which looked very novel for lupus. In fact, this all was pointing to known biology. BCL6 has been, is a key transcription factor in TFH cells. Um, and really probably the only novelty we found here was that we'd found a novel upstream regulatory element to BCL6. So Andrew found it hilarious. As not being, as he wasn't a GWASer, he found it hilarious that us GWASers always named our GWAS loci after the nearest gene. And so he thought, well, let me take all the genes that are nearest lupus signals and let's do pathway analysis and see which of those pathways are known to be relevant to TFH biology. And two of the top 10 pathways work. However, when we took the genes that came out of our approach, we found that 10 out of the 10 pathways were relevant to TFH function. Now, of course, we carry this out in TFH cells. I get that. But of course, the variants that were reported initially were only found in cases and controls in blood-derived DNA. So we found it noteworthy that there was so much known biology coming out of this approach. And so what we could do is actually triage a lot of those targets away, whereas we might have got, in the old days, might have got hung up thinking we had a new gene at a GWAS loci, whereas the data is actually pointing to known biology. What that left us with, with was a handful of new genes, and that's where we're placing our emphasis and um, doing functional characterization and where an existing drug exists, working with that as well. So coming back to the type 2 diabetes uh, pediatric route that I'm interested in and these traits that I'm working on, um, I, uh, we've also applied it in these contexts, and I'll just run you through that as well. So bone mineral density is of, of great interest to me. And again, Alessandra in my group did this work as well. She looked at uh, the top signal we have for pediatric wrist BMD. And this signal also comes up in adults for uh, I think it's spine and hip. And so this signal lies across four genes. And the main candidate gene is WINT16, given WINTs are very implicated in bone. However, when we did this approach and we took the Sentinel SNP and found two SNPs in very strong LD, but also in very close proximity, basically within the same LD peak, um, we found that they looked, they were open and they looked to two genes, CPED1 and ING3, and not WINT16. And in fact, ING3 has never really been part of, a, has, has not received any focus uh, at this locus previous to this. And working with the University of Michigan, we asked them, well, can you knock down these uh, three genes in an osteoblast model and see what you get? And the blue represents alkaline phosphatase, a measure of osteoblast activity, and red is an indication of mineralization. And what we had was a clear winner, which was ING3, that when we perturbed ING3, the osteoblast behaved less like an osteoblast. We did not see that with CPED1, or Win 16, but it would be that it would be not for the faint of heart to completely dismiss CPED1 and Win 16. All we're saying is that in the, the cell state that we were working in on that particular day, the way the sun was shining on those cells, ING3 was at play. So we're ruling in ING3, but we're not ruling out CPED1 or Win 16, as they could be involved at different stages in the cell development. But we were pleased to, to have a novel gene at this locus. Let me use the sleep example as well. And so what we've been doing here is because sleep is such a conserved trait, um, all basically all animals sleep, um, that we could take our we could take our spatial genomics findings 
and then um, uh, and then take those that candidate gene list and run them through model organisms. So first of all, we took our gene list through flies, and then subsequently took the flies, the, the, the fly genes that were positive, and ran them through fish. And this is really what our screen looked like. We took our gene list and we saw a distribution of uh, sleep time. And on the left here, you'll see some genes in red. Those are short sleepers, and the genes on the right are long sleepers. And so these were the extremes of the distribution. And we got particularly interested early on with one gene that came out early in our screen, which was pig Q, a long sleep gene that we saw. And then we knocked that out in the uh, fruit fly. Uh, so that, this is the fruit fly data. So various metrics, I won't go into it in any detail, but various metrics of sleep and waking activity were perturbed in pig Q uh, knockout Drosophila in two different lines. And then Amber Zimmerman uh, in my group uh, subsequently uh, um, knocked down uh, this in, fruit fly, in, in fish and also saw perturbed sleep in the fish. So we, from two model organisms, um, we're now excited enough about pig Q to now take it forward into a mammalian system, probably mice. In type 2 diabetes, uh, we are lucky to have a sizable NIH grant to do variant to gene mapping at scale for various, uh, uh, for uh, type 2 diabetes loci. And these are my fellow um, uh, PIs, and we're doing a computational piece and we're also doing functional follow up in various different systems, pancreas, liver, and skeletal muscle, and adipose. One of our first studies that came out uh, was uh, analyzed by uh, Chun Su, working with Klaus Kessner, and we were very happy to be on the front page of cell metabolism. And, in the, and the difference here is that we did it with HiC. So we used the ARIMA kit, rather than doing a promoter capture, high, uh, promoter capture C, we went with the ARIMA high C because it was at the right resolution. It's, a, it's using a four cutter. It was actually using two four cutters, so it's particularly chopped up. And this gave us the resolution we were looking for. We could adopt, we could adapt our existing bioinformatics that we had in-house to apply this and to be able to derive the same information from, from the data set, plus, of course, also derive TADs while doing it. And what Chun did here was saying, which of these cell types in the pancreas, acinar, alpha, or beta cells, are actually relevant to, uh, uh, type, uh, to disease? So rather than guessing which cell type we should look at with respect to calling the genes, we could actually ask which GWASs are enriched in our features derived from chromatin capture and ataxy. And so what we saw here was in the case of type 2 diabetes, we saw the enrichment was uh, contained to alpha and beta cells. Therefore, we were motivated to do the variant gene mapping in alpha and beta cells. Uh, whereas pancreatic cancer seemed to be specific to acinar cells. So again, there's a motivation to do follow-up there. What's particularly strong and working, unfortunately, with the late Casey Brown, who passed earlier this year, unfortunately, a um, uh, big loss for, for the group. Um, but when we uh, when we do a confluence of evidence by intersecting our chromatin capture data with EQTLs, which is another way of doing variant gene mapping through correlating uh, variants with gene expression, um, we really could build up a confluence of evidence for certain leads, um, and in this case, for human liver uh, traits. So, in summary, um, we uh, are not the only people on the planet doing variant to function analyses. Where we're putting our flag is with the chromatin capture area. Um, of course, there are other approaches like EQTLs, luciferase, MPRA, ChIP-seq, ATAC-seq, algorithms that can predict uh, to some degree uh, uh, causal genes and causal variants. Um, but what we're finding particularly powerful now is when we follow up our variant to gene pairs with CRISPR-I based methods at scale, we're getting quite a good validation rate doing that. So we're, 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 we're pretty fired up about using this for variant to gene mapping. And ultimately, we may even want to do this in a temporal way 
um, as as um, Chicago and, and Marcelo and Abrego showed with AFTO Locus and his team, showing that depending on the state of the cell, different genes are at play. And I could just leave you at one, one, one last thought, is that GWAS is, uh, uh, has limitations in that we, it really requires massive sample sizes to find the entire genetic repertoire uh, for a particular trait. So we know there's thousands of variants associated with, uh, with a trait. But we, you know, we're limited by power and we really need that five times 10 to the minus eight p-value to get above that threshold. But Reza here said, well, what about if we look at the signals that are below the threshold that are not strictly genome-wide significant, but we can we pull them out based on them being enriched in our uh, features of being open and being contacting a gene promoter? And could he go back to an old BMI GWAS and predict that certain variants would go on to be genome-wide significant in a subsequent BMI GWAS. And this did prove to be successful. Again, I won't go into too much detail, but it helped draw out sub-threshold GWAS signals um, that went on to ultimately become genome-wide significant. So with that, uh, obviously this is a team effort and I have a, a variety of collaborators and of course a, a great team working in the grant lab, um, some of whom are pictured here, past and present, and, um, and and of course, we're working on a number of diseases, as you'll see from my funding, we're working in a number of disease areas, um, doing uh, functional follow-up from our variant to gene approach using chromatin capture. And I'll leave it there. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Grant, for that wonderful presentation. All right, we're ready to jump into the Q&A. I see we have a few questions. Um, so I'll kind of go from the top and um, it looks like these are primarily for you right now, Anthony. So I'll start with the first one. Are there web-based interfaces where genome-wide DNA interactions can be queried in different kinds of tissues? Yeah, um, I'm sure there are several. Um, I, I guess I can speak to the ones that I personally uh, use um, in my kind of day-to-day -day work. So Fong Yue uh, hosts um, <clears throat> a web-based interface that has lots of high c maps and um, capture high c data and a variety of different, you know, um, chromatin confirmation capture data sets. If you go to his website, um, there's a link to that uh, web-based analysis interface. Okay. And then the second one that I use a lot is um, uh, Juicebox, uh, which was developed by the Aiden Lab. And if you go to the Aiden Lab's website, uh, I think it's like Aiden Lab. Uh, I have it open right now, actually. Yeah, AidenLab.org uh, slash Juicebox. Um, I was just checking now. I think there's like over 500 um, high C maps or about 450 maybe uh, from the 40 nucleome consortium alone. And, and there's a lot of other data on there too to readily um, upload and analyze. And you can have different high C maps up at the same time. Uh, and it's really helpful for me at least. Yeah, thanks Anthony. And, and there's like the desktop version and the web version, right? So um, if you wanna, have more interactivity, more features, you can always download the desktop, but web is a great place to start. You don't have to download anything. Yeah, that is a wonderful tool for sure. Um, all right, another question. Um, let's let's do this one and then I'll ask a question to Dr. Strun, Dr. Grant. Um, is Arima working on single cell high C kits? Yeah, actually um, we had a great webinar, I think, Janetta, maybe that was towards the end of 2022 or maybe in early 2023. Yes. That was all focused on single cell uh, high C or single cell methyl high C uh, from three different researchers. Um, one from Joe Ecker's lab, one from, uh, you know, Chang Wan Lo uh, also presented, <clears throat> as well as Long Shi Tan, who's now, I believe, uh, faculty at Stanford. Um, all of those three researchers have used ARIMA kits in their single cell high C or single cell methyl high C uh, workflows. Uh, so those those kits are available. Um, we typically like to have uh, calls with anyone who's interested in those techniques to sort of talk uh, to talk through it and 
to try to set you up for success if you want to uh, pursue some of those single cell high seed methods. And I think there's also been some really interesting papers out just in the past uh, few weeks uh, on single cell high C with other modalities like RNA uh, seed. Multiomics. I love that. That's right. Um, and like Anthony mentioned, we do have a webinar on single cell. If you guys go to our website and just search for single cell, that will come up. Um, we have some blog posts as well, or um, feel free to reach out to, to us with uh, many additional questions. All right. Um, now I have a uh, question for Dr. Grant um, from Amar. Fantastic talks, Dr. Struan. What are your thoughts on changes in chromatin interactions in disease context? What is the value of data obtained from healthy individuals versus data from disease samples or under disease stimuli? Yeah, no, that's a very good question, and it does come up um, with uh, with when I when I present. Um, what I'm interested in is uh, trying to find the susceptibility to a disease. So a variant that raises your risk um, for a disease and then, and then the car crash happens, if you will. So what I'm interested in is really in the, in the healthy context. It's, it's that preparation for the onset of the disease. So we're looking at susceptibility variant and what it's regulating in normal times. And that is the potential target. I haven't ventured into uh, or my team hasn't ventured into disease tissue per se, but I think there's a lot of scope there to um, look at 3D architectural differences between patients and controls. Maybe not so much with respect to GWAS, of course you could incorporate that, but really just understanding if there's 3D architectural signatures associated with disease. So I think it would be a, a really cool, cool thing to do. And as I mentioned before, we know these are dynamic processes. They are temporal, as you say in your question, that there are changes in interactions. To understand those changes over the time of disease progression, for instance, I think has a lot of utility. Thank you for that. Um, keep upvoting those questions. Um, here's, here's another one uh, from Itai. Very interesting talks. I especially appreciate the notion of using TADS to help define the possible neighborhood of regulatory interactions and subset down target genes for a GWAS lo locus. I wonder if you would have any particular recommendations about which TAD inference algorithms may reveal functionally relevant TAD structures at this scale, given the very high number of different options here. Arima might know about those resources better than I do. I mean, uh, if I can be very simplistic about this, is that, uh, that TADs largely are tissue independent. So irrespective of the cell type you look at, the, the TAD boundaries tend to be the same. And that's useful because it means that um, that search space is set, you know, before I go into any particular cell type. Now that's getting nuanced now that I understand that at least a minority of TADs do change with um, with uh, cell state. But I think it's 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 a very useful um, uh, delineator or uh, determining where you you set your search space. And the average TAD is about a million base pairs, and I think the average gene contents is about fifteen genes. So that's sort of where you should look, but there are there are public. I don't know them off the top of my head, but there are public domain TAD coordinates that one can use. Anthony, do you have any recommendations there? Yeah, actually, this has been a kind of a a recent topic of interest at Arima, is we have historically always used the TAD calling tools within the juice the juicer tools framework, um, but in some in some cases, at least in our experience. Um, there are times, you know, I think Juicer Tools uh, was particularly developed for very high, high resolution, high C data sets. Um, and in some of the lower sequencing data sets, uh, you know, for people who may be cost constrained, we have found that it hasn't worked that well to identify TADs, both in sort of number and, um, and then we've, we've been looking around at, you know, some of the literature, there's a, actually quite a few papers that Bake off uh, twenty to thirty different, you know, tab calling programs, and you know, one of those articles, the one that sort of surfaced to the top based on five different uh, criteria, 
including robustness to sequencing depth was a program called TopDom. Uh, and then, and so we've been testing that out in our own hands and, and indeed finding that it's worked well across a range of different, you know, sequencing depths from uh, genome-wide high C experiments. So that, you know, I think in our hands that has seemed pretty robust. Thanks, Anthony. Um, I'm thinking there's a lot of tools that we're discussing here, so maybe we can include that um, in the follow-up um, to, to all of the registrants. Um, so we'll, we'll try to include that for, you, for everyone here. Um, this one is a bit of a broader question, but um, either to Dr. Grant or to Anthony, how stable or volatile are those interactions and what is regulating, assuming high team interactions? Yeah, I mean, uh, how stable or volatile? Yeah, I mean, I think I would use the word probably how temporal or some and how how fixed or some. And um, I think that's still to be fully elucidated. I think as we do as as the, the field does more time course experiments. Um, but as I say, that's why I'm cautious in saying I'm ruling in rather than ruling out, um, because if 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 the FTO locus is relatively typical. That's what it turns out to be. Then there's a lot of play at these low sides. One more question that either Dr. Grant or Anthony can take, uh, maybe related to this previous one, but um, about using high C to nominate putative causal causal genes. Our experience is that high C interactions tend to be noisy and can imply multiple potential target genes at a locus. Given that, how do you reduce the uncertainty in nominating causal genes? Yeah, no, that's that's a good point, and it, it certainly does throw out false positives. That's why I'm very much in favor of doing functional follow-up uh, as, as, as the examples I gave. Um, but yeah, replicates, that's the key thing is to do uh, multiple replicates to look for those consistent loops. Um, that will reduce the noise. And again, we are not looking, in terms of my approach, we're not, um, or our approach, sorry, I'm, for the Royal, the Royal we. Uh, my, my my team, um, the uh, the constraining it on attack seek is is the key thing here. So we, we we're basing it on just a, a limited number of variants and looking at the loops there. But doing it in replicate, doing it uh, with uh, multiple replicates helps us find those consistent loops. And resolution, sorry, resolution is the other thing. And resolution. Yeah. All right, um, we are past the hour. I don't know if there's any questions. Um, the panelists can see all the questions. If there's anything that you want to answer right now, otherwise we'll wrap it up. You just a minute to read. Yeah, I mean, this last question from, from Ivy. Um, yeah, that's a good point. I mean, we, we're, we're definitely doing that more and more as looking at once we've established a variant to gene connection, and we think we've got a putative, we've got a putative causal variant. Then we do ask what TFs are binding there, and um, um, that's definitely an area of, of of great interest to us. All right. Well, we're going to wrap it up. Thank you, everyone who stayed here till the very end. Um, wonderful presentations from both speakers. Thank you, Dr. Grant, for being here and for being here live, answering all our questions, putting you on the spot. Um, Anthony, thank you as well. And uh, with that, we're gonna wrap it up and have a great rest of your Wednesday, everyone.